Now, it's important in doing this work to be clear about the challenges and not to overstate what the effects have been. And in the next couple of slides, I've highlighted some of the challenges. We need to keep those in mind. First of all, most reforms are still being implemented. I mean, Basel III itself is not going to be implemented before 2019 at the earliest, and then this grandfathering as well, some other provisions that go beyond that. Um, shadow banking reforms have barely begun. And so we need to be clear or distinguish between the longer term steady state effects and what is short term transition effects. And right now we're in a transition process in most areas. And relatedly, the short term transition is usually about costs because it's costly to transition to a new steady state. The longer term is more about the benefits and we need to, again, keep that in mind. We should not underestimate the ability of industry to adjust to the new measures. It will be costly, but the, we, should not keep, we should keep in mind the intention. Relatedly, it's challenging, to, especially nowadays, to disentangle the effects from other conjunctural factors. And it's particularly relevant for Europe, given everything else that's been taking place in recent years. This is, this is an important issue to keep in mind. Um, the exceptional macroeconomic environment, the um, QE, zero interest rates, those are sh hiding some of the effects, maybe, to the, maybe for the benefit or maybe, maybe for the better or maybe for the worst. But it's important to distinguish those because some of the effects we're going to be picking up are not about the international agreed reforms. They're about the overall broader macro environment. And relatedly, a number of the effects we're going to be picking up are not about the international agreed reforms, they're about gold plating at the national level. It's important to stress that because there have been a lot of individual national initiatives, obviously for good reason, but they go beyond the international agreed reforms. Structural reforms is one example. Reform the provisions about compensation, say, in CRT4, the cap on fixed to variable. This is not part of the FSB's uh, principles, uh, necessarily. I mean, th these are reforms that go beyond what the international agreed reforms have been about, but when you, do about, when you assess the effects, you're going to pick up the effects from those as well. The other point to keep in mind, of course, is that there are distributional issues, and there are unintended consequences are often in the eyes of the beholder. So some effects may not be universally seen as intended because they reduce access to finance. But if the choice is between more finance that's not sound and less finance that's sound, I think that our members would choose the latter. Um, this is not to say that there will be, there may not be uh, intended effects in certain areas, in certain market segments, and we need to look carefully at them and what implications are and whether we need to tweak the regulations to deal with them. But um, it's important to keep in mind that the benchmark for comparison is not the pre-crisis period. We're not comparing to the pre-crisis period. The pre-crisis period was an exceptional period characterized by a lot of uh, financing, much of it wasted, and we should keep that in mind uh, when we do these kinds of analysis. So it's important to keep the, all these factors in mind in doing this kind of comprehensive impact. Um, and so while we certainly welcome the initiative by the, e, uh, by the European Commission to collect evidence, and we're looking for hard evidence on all of these measures, uh, this is only the first step. It's a multi-year effort. We're going to take, we're going to continue doing that. It's part of our mandate, and we will try to, we will continue to encourage it. Our primary focus has been on is prudential, is to enhance bank resilience in the um, less, le trying to learn the lessons from the crisis. And there, um, as indicated by some of the reports coming out of the Basel Committee, we, uh, I think we can, we can safely say that the reforms have helped to strengthen resilience. If by resilience you mean greater, more capital, more liquidity, um, better funding profiles, etc. It's not shown on the slides, but most of the adjustment made by the industry, by the, by the banks to the uh, rec capital requirements has been through 
uh, retain earnings. It hasn't been by, cu to cu by cutting back lending um, uh, or uh, adjusting risk weights. Um, we will present some of this analysis further in the report to the G20. So, and it's, as you can see, the industry is almost there in terms of actually fulfilling its requirements years ahead of time, in spite of all the complaints. Now, progress in other areas is being made, resolution re regimes uh, through the BRRD, um, over-the-counter derivatives reforms and the like, uh, implementation is still at an earlier stage. I think the, the, the reform that went first is uh, Basel III, and there you can already see that there have been tangible, tangible um, examples of uh, bank resilience enhancements. Now, the FSB is vigilant to identify and address material and intended consequences. Some of the areas that we are looking at for monitoring purposes are the ones you see on these slides. Um, what has financial intermediation, how has financial intermediation moved, um, especially including the supply of long-term investment finance, whether there are any uh, regulations that might be impeding it, and it is um, evidence of that. We're very keen to, to, to look at it, uh, but we should keep in mind that the it's a little bit like monetary policy, one objective, one instrument. You don't use, you, you don't use prudential regulation to incentivize. In prudential regulation should capture the risk coming from that activity. And you don't want to artificially stimulate a certain activity by reducing capital, for example. So that debate has to be very technical. It has to be based on facts and it has to capture appropriately, has to reflect their actual risks in the business. Market liquidity is the one other area that's been mentioned by um, a, a number of, um, it's, it's in the press nowadays, and we're looking carefully at it. A number of our members are looking carefully at it. The IMF just publishes Global Financial Stability Report that includes a chapter looking at market liquidity. Uh, work's been done in the US on this issue. Bank of England is gonna come up with uh, some work. Um, and we're looking at carefully at it because of the links to financial stability, the implications of it, and obviously uh, what may be uh, prompting it. Again, this is a clear example where the extraordinary macroeconomic circumstances may also have an effect, may also be causing some of this issue. If, if market makers are not paid the benefit from doing market making, uh, is muted by the environment of low volatility and low interest rates and lots of QE and liquidity in the market, maybe they don't want to play that game. If that changes, this may change as well. So again, we have to be careful what is between what is a transitional effect versus what is a longer term steady state effect. A third area is the effects of reforms on emerging market and developing economies. We have a mandate from the G20 to monitor and report on this, making sure that the reforms do not create um, problems for uh, uh, the emerging markets, some of which are sitting at the table. Ten of our members are emerging markets, but there's a lot of others who are not, and this is one of the reasons we're trying to reach out to them through, this region, through the regional consultative groups. And finally, it's about maintaining an open and integrated global financial system. And we're monitoring the, uh, carefully how the evolution, what the evolution has been of cross-border financial intermediation um, in various types.